So you want to learn how to deadlift? So much, man. So much, man. The My Brother and Gains, you have come to the right place. See, back in the conception of powerlifting, the deadlift was considered to be the king of all the lifts, the manliest of all lifts. You versus the weight on the bar. There's no other apparatus. There's no bench. There's no squat rack, no monolift, no, no whatever. The bar on the floor, and all you got to do is pick it up. The ultimate concept of a powerful lift. However, the forefathers of powerlifting did not foresee the intelligence that would come with modern day powerlifters and the deadlift has evolved from its original conception of just picking the bar up off the floor the deadlift has become a kind of major sticking point a talking point the most controversial of the three lifts because it's gotten to the point where we've developed strategies and methods some forms and techniques in order to minimize the amount of actual strength required in order to perform the depth. Now, this isn't hating on the uh, modern day lifters. It is basically utilizing a loophole in the, in the rules of powerlifting in order to produce a higher total through methods that technically are legal. The deadlift is a leverage lift. It is the most heavily dependent on what your leverages are and what leverages you can take advantage of. The two different kinds of deadlifts that are legal in competition utilize leverages in order to maximize the amount of weight lifted off the floor. And we're gonna go into that in this video. Now for deadlifts, there's really only three options when it comes to equipment that you can use to perform the deadlift. And that comes into the variety of three different bars. There is the power bar, which is used in a lot of the all natural federations like the USAPL, the federations that use a single bar for all three lifts, like a power bar for squat, bench, and deadlift. They don't change the bar out, they use the same bar throughout the entire lift. And then there is the Texas deadlift bar, which most powerlifting gyms will have. It is the bread and butter of powerlifting meets. The, the bar that they use on the majority of platforms, a Texas deadlift bar is what most people will use when performing the deadlift. So a lot of gyms have had these bars around for years and years because it's been around for years and years and it's been a very consistent, a very high quality bar that most gyms are able to afford to get and utilize for deadlift. And then there is the new Kabuki deadlift bar. The, the Kabuki deadlift bar is coming onto the scene and it is important to know what the difference between the Kabuki bar, Texas deadlift bar, and the power bar are for the deadlift because they do affect the deadlift in different ways and the different bar can dictate whether or not you have different PRs on the different bars because there is a significant difference between the three bars. Now we have all three deadlift bars here. We have the Kabuki up front. Up next we have the Texas deadlift bar. And then we also have a power bar. The first thing that comes to know in the difference between the three bars is the length of the hub, the diff distance that the weight will sit in accordance to the center of the bar. If you notice, the Kabuki bar sits way further out. It's got the longest hub of all three, and it sits the plates a little further than the Texas deadlift bar. The Texas deadlift bar still holds the weight further away than the power bar, which is the bar all the way at the left power bar, which has the shortest active bar length of the three, whereas the Kabuki deadlift bar has the longest active part of the bar. Also, the hub length is different between the three. The Kabuki deadlift bar has an, a shorter hub length than the Texas deadlift bar, and the power bar actually has a kind of shorter hub for the weight. So you can fit less weights on a power bar than you can on the Kabuki or Texas deadlift bar. Texas deadlift bar has the longest hub of them all. The next thing to note is the location of the rings on the Kabuki bar. The ring is here. On the Texas deadlift bar, the ring is a little further out. And on the power bar, the ring is at the same distance as the Texas deadlift bar. So the ring length point where you're going to set up is going to be different according to the ring length on the Kabuki deadlift bar versus a Texas deadlift bar where the Texas deadlift bar has the ring length further out closer to the hub of the bar as opposed to the Kabuki deadlift bar. You can set up the same on the Texas deadlift bar and the power bar because the ring length is the same distance from the center. The Kabuki bar is a variant on that. The biggest difference between the three different bars, the power bar, the Texas deadlift bar, and the Kabuki bar is the amount of width that the bar has. This is the amount of slack that 
the weight on the sides of the bar is going to give before it leaves the ground. The Ohio Power Bar, or the, the generic Power Bar, is also known as a stiff bar because it doesn't have that much give. I have all three different types of bars loaded up with 315 here to kind of demonstrate the difference in whip. There isn't gonna be much whip at 315 pounds. The more weight that you add to the bar, the more noticeable the whip is. Once you get up to the 700 pound range, then it becomes a noticeably different in the amount of whip the bar has. So the first bar that we have here is the Ohio Power Bar. <sighs> Notice that if I jiggle it at all, it doesn't really whip at all. Next up, I have the Texas Deadlift Bar, which is a little softer than the Power Bar. It's the go-to for a lot of meat directors and powerlifting because it's the most available bar. So a lot of people are able to compete with the uh, Texas Deadlift Bar. If you notice, I can jiggle it a little bit. And it's got a little bit of whip there. And that's the whip that I'm talking about. And then the last bar here is the Kabuki deadlift bar. It is the softest of all the bars. It also has the longest active bar length of all the bars. So the weights are more distributed further away from the center. So it gets a lot more whip in it. You can see I can jiggle it and it gets a, a fair amount of, of jiggle. And that's the biggest difference between the three bars. When it comes to equipment that you can attach to your body to perform the deadlift, you're pretty limited in your options. There's really only kind of two things that you can attach your body to help you perform the deadlift. Now, note, I will not say that straps are, lifting straps of any kind that will attach your body to the deadlift bar is not legal in competition. So we will not go over how to use lifting straps or what lifting straps do in the deadlift because they are not legal for competition. So the first thing you need to know is what you're going to attach to your body directly. The first thing is a lifting belt. So to put on a lifting belt, this is a lever belt, which means that it has a prong that sets inside of the belt and then it levers tight. And all you do is you put it on your body and you put the prongs in and you can choose to either tighten it so that you have that core pressure a little tighter, it's going to increase the blood pressure in your head. So you may elect not to latch your lever belt when you use it, or you can leave it like this so that you have at least something present for you to push up against so you can get a better internal pressure while doing the deadlift. Still better than not wearing a belt at all. The other option that you can have for a belt is a regular pronged belt. This is a belt that's kind of like the belt that you'll put in your dress pants, where you just loop the belt in through whatever fastener, and then you find the hole, and you tighten it, and it is tight around yourself, and you're able to push up against it to perform the deadlift. Some people like Konstantin Konstantinov, a legendary conventional deadlifter, elected not to use a belt whatsoever, saying that the internal core pressure that you create is sufficient enough that you don't need to weaken your internal structure by using a belt. That's for you to decide. Sumo deadlifters such as Yuri Belkin have a similar mindset where they don't use a belt in competition or in training because they don't want to uh, lean on a piece of equipment like a belt in order to create that internal pressure. They want to be strong on their own, but a belt is legal for competition, so might as well use one. The next piece of equipment that you need to consider is what you're gonna put on your feet. What kind of things are you gonna put on your feet for competition? Because you want your foot to be as flat as possible to the floor. You don't want any sort of elevation. You don't want any sort of heel raise. You don't want any sort of like compression in your heel and your foot whatsoever to mitigate the amount of power that you're gonna express toward the floor to move the bar. So you really only have two and a half options when it comes to what you're gonna put on your feet. This is a Chuck Taylor shoe. It has a flat sole, and this is the first kind of shoe that you might wanna consider. You, the, the similar brands such as Vans, uh, DCs, that have a flat sole that don't provide much support whatsoever in the heel. It's not very squishy or anything. The newer kind of shoes that are out there that are kind of taking place of Chuck Taylors in competition are like Vivo's Barefoot, like Shane Hunt uses, kind of these barefoot kind of shoes because they want to have some sort of foot protection like a shoe provides, but they want to have the ability to feel the floor through the shoe where 
this has a rubber sole so you can't exactly feel the floor very well and the these barefoot shoes are allowing you to contact the floor a little bit better through your feet you're able to root into place better feel the floor better and express your power through the floor better than if you're going to have some sort of cushion under your foot like a rubber sole or a foam sole or like whatever nike has in their shoes you want to be able to make the most efficient contact with the floor with your foot. And that brings us to our second option. There is such thing called deadlift slippers. They are slippers that were pretty much designed in order to be competed in. They're not walking around shoes like the Vivos or the, the Barefoots would be out there. They are literally just slippers that you put on your feet. They have a heel in the back so that it is competition legal. Most deadlift slippers will have Velcro straps to attach the slipper to your foot a little bit better. But since I am cheap, I went to Walmart and I bought $5 grandpa slippers and I cut the sole off so that I can feel the floor through the bottom of the shoe. Because in competition, a lot of federations don't allow you to go barefoot or even have just socks on. They want some sort of foot covering on. According to the rule books, this is legal. And I have used these grandpa slippers, grandpa deadlift slippers, the uh, Walmart $5 slipper in competition multiple times. This allows me to have virtually no foot covering while having a foot covering. So it allows me to get away with basically deadlifting barefoot because I personally prefer to deadlift either completely barefoot or in just socks. Now that we have all the options for equipment that you can use or apply to yourself in order to perform the deadlift, now we can talk about how to actually perform the deadlift. Before you actually do a deadlift, the first thing you have to do is grab the bar. And there's actually two and a half options that are viable for competition in order to grab the bar before you even start the deadlift. The first way is called mixed grip, where you put one of your hands on top, one of the hands supporting the bar from below. The issue with deadlifts is when you lift the bar up, it wants to roll in a direction. And if you have both your hands on top, it's going to want to roll out of your hand. So if you grip the bar and it ends up rolling like that, and the mixed grip, like this, this hand makes the bar want to roll away from you. And this hand makes the bar want to roll towards you. So these opposing forces ends up stabilizing the bar in your hand and you're able to deadlift. The problem with this is it puts your underhand in a compromising position. And what happens is if you get any sort of bend in your arm, especially at heavier loads, that causes a bicep tear and it causes the tendon to tear off at your elbow and roll up your arm. But despite that, it is still the most popular way to hold the bar. The next method is called hook grip, which is a misnomer because you're not actually gripping the bar. You are utilizing the leverages, basically abusing the laws of physics in order to hold on to the bar. This is by far the superior grip when it comes to deadlifting. However, there is a very extremely large barrier to entry when it comes to performing the hook grip, and that is pain and suffering because it is extremely difficult to get used to because you end up tearing the inside of your thumb a lot, it hurts a lot, and it goes against a lot of your internal instincts to perform the hook grip. To perform the hook grip, what you do, you put your hand on the bar, you don't wanna grab it, you wanna reach your thumb across the bar, and with either your middle finger or ring finger, you wanna grab your thumb and hook it under. So you put your thumb under the bar and then you lay your fingers over and you have the edge of your thumb hooked with one of your fingers. I have very large hands, very thick fingers. My pinky is about the average size of a grown man's thumb for reference. So when I perform the hook grip, I can't reach with this middle finger and it ends up laying on top and that ends up just being double overhand. What I do, due to the size of my hands and the girth of my fingers, I have to grab with my ring finger and this allows me to hold on to the bar. But notably, you want to hold the bar as far down your thumb as you can. So you don't want the bar laying down here because that's going to roll the bar and tear this skin. You want it to be as close to the tip of your thumb as possible and you want to have as light of a 
a grip on the bar as possible to allow the bar to do its thing and not actually affect your hands. You want the bar basically as far away from the pad of your thumb as possible on the tip of your thumb basically and then grab it with your fingers and you hook your fingers around your fingers and then you got a good grip on the bar. When I said there were two and a half methods, I meant mixed grip where you've got the mixing of the over under, the hook grip where you hook your fingers and the half which is doable but not really viable for powerlifting is double overhand. As we've discussed before, this causes the bar to roll out of your hands like this. But if you're looking to develop your grip strength, it is very good to practice doing the double overhand because the bar trying to roll out of your hand, you've got to squeeze very tight and it's very grip strength dependent. And you're going to develop your forearms and you'll be able to have a stronger grip if you practice the double overhand. But in competition, you're not gonna to wanna to do double overhand because of the rolling out of your hand you end up dropping more deadlifts than you complete so you only really have two and a half ways that you can deadlift the mixed grip the hook grip and the kind of double overhand that's the half earlier i mentioned that there's an old school way of deadlifting and a new school way of deadlifting which abuses the leverages of your body to perform the deadlift this is the most controversial part when it comes to deadlifting because the old school way is the manly way to deadlift, but the new school way is how you deadlift more. It's almost like the difference between a leg press and a squat. A lot of really light people, light lifters, like 181s deadlifting 900 pounds because they are abusing the ability to leverage the weight up. But you'll see a lot of super heavies, like 300, 400 pound deadlifters with six, 700 pound deadlifts that are struggling with the deadlift because they aren't able to get in the correct positions to be able to leverage the deadlift up. And, and this, what I'm talking about is the difference between conventional and sumo. So conventional deadlifts, and sumo deadlifts. The two ways to do the deadlifts. Conventional method is the old school method. You have your feet nice and close and you pick the bar up off the ground. Sumo deadlifts is abusing the body's leverages in order to get yourself in a position where you have a minimal range of motion in order to pick the bar up off the ground. Both are acceptable in competition. Sumo is a lot like the tango. If you don't know what you're doing, it's gay as fuck. But if you know what you're doing, it is beautiful and artistic. Basically like a Ford Mustang and a conventional deadlift is like a Ford F-350. You got two cars with strong engines. The Ford F-350 is going to be able to pull things really heavy. The muscle car, the Ford Mustang, is going to be that muscle car, that, that sexy thing that goes really fast, is really loud, but they're both cars. One is just stronger differently than the other. The conventional deadlift is a simulated jump. The mechanics and muscles used in order to perform the conventional deadlift are the same as jumping. You load up your glutes, hamstrings, and you jump. What you want to do is you want the same foot distance apart that you would take when performing a jump. And that's about kind of slightly inside of shoulder width. You want to be flexing your glutes and your hamstrings when you're just standing up straight. That's how you know that you're in close enough and you're tight. For me, that is slightly inside with my shins lined up kind of inside of the bare part of the bar. What you wanna do is you wanna reach down, grab the bar and fill your core with air. This is gonna put you kind of over your toes and you're gonna feel yourself go onto your toes a little bit. And when you fill your core up, you wanna expand your stomach and then get ready to get punched in the stomach. This is proper bracing for deadlifts. So you take your air and what you wanna do is you wanna pinch your scaps and bring them down. So you basically, you get real tight up on the bar. Next, you wanna drive your knees forward over the bar and you wanna lean back so that you are bringing the weight of the bar in the middle of your foot to the heel of your foot. You basically slam your heels down and you drive through the middle of your foot to perform the deadlift. You wanna keep a straight spine. So 
you want to tuck your chin and basically try to give yourself a double chin so that you're not rounding in any weird spots in your neck. Rounding does happen in the back at heavy loads, but it's where the rounding happens that is negative. The upper back is usually where the rounding happens, but if you have any sort of lumbar or lower back rounding, that's when you get into trouble. That's when you herniate discs. That's when you get injured while performing the deadlift. Having a proper brace in your core will prevent that lower back rounding. And having your lats properly set before you start deadlifting is how you're gonna have a healthy deadlift going on. So let's go through the steps. You set your feet, you grab the bar, you take your breath, drive your knees forward, and pull through the middle of your foot to your heels. So let's do it faster now, more real time. Let's look at it from a side view. Common things you need to look out for while performing the deadlift, if you take a video and watch it back, are three, three major things going on. If your hips start to rise before the bar does, you need to get tighter on the bar. Your brace is too soft, your lats are not set, and the bar is pulling you forward onto your toes. The other two things are your knees and your hips locking out. They need to lock out approximately around the same time. That means that you are pulling from the correct area. The, middle of your foot to your heels. If one or the other is locking out before the other, means that likely means that you're going onto your toes. Usually that'll mean that your knees are locking out a lot more before your hips, and, and it turns the deadlift into a stiff leg deadlift, which you got all these hamstrings, these glutes, and these quads acting. A stiff leg deadlift is highly dependent on the erectors, which is smaller than all those other muscles put together. So you wanna properly deadlift to save your back, you want to be pulling from the correct areas. You want to have the correct pressure on the floor. You want to be tight in your lats, your core, your glutes, your hamstrings. Everything needs to be firing on all cylinders because deadlift is highly dependent on the setup. Everything that happens after the setup is because your setup was incorrect. So you have to set up correctly in order to have a good deadlift. That is very important and conventional, but even more so when it comes to sumo. Now let me show you how to sumo deadlift. The setup in the sumo deadlift is more important for the full sumo deadlift than the setup in the conventional. If you set up any sort of incorrectness in your sumo deadlift setup, the whole lift is going to fall apart. You have to consider your toe angle, your hip height, your lats, your core, your head, your grip. Now, if you noticed, when I was pulling conventional, I pulled mixed grip. And when I pulled sumo, I, I pulled hook grip. It is even more difficult for larger lifters to have the mixed grip when it comes to sumo because the, you end up gripping further inside than if you were in conventional. This means that I have to basically bring my grip in and I'm at a weird angle and it doesn't feel any sort of good. So I elect to do the hook grip so that my shoulders and back are straight away. Now, this doesn't mean you can't pull mixed grip. You can elect to not learn hook grip because it, it, it is a pain in the ass to learn. But pulling sumo, you have, to, you have a lot more things to consider. It is more dependent on technicality than it is on strength. That's why you'll see lighter lifters who are mobile, flexible, and lighter lifting heavier deadlifts than the, the super heavies who are pulling conventional. And as it stands now, all the top deadlifters right now outside of Dan Bell are all sumo deadlifters. They're able to wedge their hips, leverage the lift up. And once you have that down, then you start developing the muscle groups that are required for increasing that deadlift far beyond 900 pounds. So how you set your feet and where you set your feet is very important when it comes to sumo. What you wanna do is if you look at your feet, you have a diagonal at this point part of your foot and you wanna set that diagonal parallel to the plates. So your feet should be angled like this. So you set your feet and you've got this parallel with this. And you set the other foot the same way. The width that you wanna set your feet is dependent on your body structure. But luckily we have these rings that'll help us make sure that that setup is consistent. So 
you set your toes up parallel with the plates. And you wanna make sure that you almost have a 45 degree angle here. And when you set up, you want your feet to basically be straight up and down. This is gonna minimize the range of motion that you're gonna need without sacrificing too many muscle groups gonna be involved. Then you're not isolating your glutes, hamstrings, and quads from the movement. So you've got your feet set. Next, you wanna grab the bar. This is another situation in sumo specifically where the difference between mixed grip and hook grip comes into play. Because if you pull sumo, if you hold on the smooth part of the bar or the knurled part of the bar, it doesn't really matter because the grip isn't dependent on the bar. It's not dependent on your grip strength. Nothing really matters except for the integrity of a system inside of your hand. So if you're pulling mixed grip, you wanna be as close in as possible without going and compromising your grip on the smooth part. But if you're pulling hook grip, you're able to put one to two fingers, maybe three fingers inside. This is gonna be wholly personally dependent, depending on what you are capable of doing, what your body dictates you can do. So I set my grip. Once I have the grip set, I wanna take my air. And it's the same bracing as with conventional. You wanna fill your stomach with air and then get ready to be punched and tighten that core up. While doing so, you want to pinch your scaps and bring them down just like in conventional. This is going to end up incorporating your hips. You don't want to bring your hips just forward or just down. You want to get your hips as close to the bar as possible while maintaining a deep level for your hips to go. You basically want to squat down with your hips, but bring your hips to the bar. As the legendary powerlifter Ed Cohn says, teabag the bar. You basically want to bring your scrotum as close as you can to the bar while in this position, staying tight. And then once you are as tight as you can, then you just lift the bar. You're the entire the act of getting your hips down and close to the bar is what's called wedging and this is kind of like the act of wedging is the abuse of your leverages available to you in the deadlift the harder you can wedge into something it's almost like you're trying to roll a wheel up a flight of stairs you get to a point where you only get one part point of contact with the wheel and the stair and it kind of wedges itself on top and it raises just by rolling so you're basically rolling the bar up by using yourself as a wedge but in the act of wedging if anything gets loose you lose the rigidity you lose the stiffness of your wedge it's almost like the stone stair that you're trying to roll a wheel up it goes soft kind of like going from cement to a balloon where it can still be tight and you can kind of still get it up but it's it's compromising and the, and the balloon can pop here's what the sumo deadlift ends up looking like side view of a sumo deadlift is important to look at occasionally because when you set up and you're wedging yourself in, you wanna make sure that your ankles, knees, and shoulders are in line. You want joints stacked up on each other and that's gonna provide you the leverage in order to lift the bar. Top sumo deadlifters are very mobile. They've got good hip mobility, good knee mobility, good ankle mobility. And these are all things that you have to add to your training in order to make sure that you have a good sumo deadlift if you elect to use the sumo deadlift. If your hips start too high, then you end up locking your knees out first and then it ends up end up becoming a uh, stiff leg sumo deadlift and it becomes highly dependent on your erectors. And the proper way to perform a sumo deadlift is kind of isolating the erectors and making sure they've got minimal role to play in the sumo deadlift. If you're finding that your knees are locking before your hips and you've got a lot of stress on your lower back, that it's, it's usually because your hips are too high in your starting position. But additionally, you can have your hips too low in your starting position. And this ends up bringing your shoulders out of whack. Things go wrong when you have your hips too low. So you gotta find the happy zone where you have a minimal range of motion, you the minimal effect on your lower back, and a speedy lockout. It is a common saying that if a sumo deadlift breaks the floor, it's gonna get locked out because the hardest part of a sumo deadlift 
is getting that leverage, getting that starting position. And if you don't get a correct starting position for the sumo deadlift, it ends up not even breaking the floor. But if it does break the floor, chances are you got a good leverage, good starting position, and it's going to be a little easier to walk out. If you're having trouble walking out, usually that means that your starting position is too high. Your hips are too high. It's all about finding and that leverage point, that leverage height of your hips, where you still have the stack joints and you're able to get the bar up off the floor without, I don't want to say without much effort because 900 pounds is 900 pounds, but a 19 year old can deadlift 900 pounds these days because they're finding good leverage points, they're finding good wedges, they're, they're able to manipulate their body in a way that reduces the range of motion as much as possible and they're able to get tight and basically roll that wheel up the, up the flight of stairs. That is all she wrote. That is how you deadlift conventional method or sumo method. The only really thing that you really need to consider when choosing which way to go is deciding whether or not you want to work on building base level strength. It takes a lot of grit and, and basic primal strength in order to perform the conventional deadlift as opposed to a lot of technical work. It is a, it is almost like the difference between a mathematician and business major in college where the business major is the conventional puller and the math major is, is the fine detail oriented sumo deadlifter. Both of them are viable. Both of them are very good. You just kind of choose one and go. But the thing to consider is when training, sumo deadlifts is the absolute best accessory for conventional deadlifts. And the best method of increasing your sumo deadlift outside of training sumo deadlift itself is training conventional deadlifts. So it doesn't hurt to train them both because you end up increasing the strength by training both. And if you're worried about getting a lot of flat for pulling sumo, just know that if you're gonna suck dick, you better be the best to suck fucking dick. Anyways, they're both viable in competition. So choose and compete with, with whichever one that is better suited for you because they're both strong, they're both good, and it's better than sitting around eating Pringles, watching Netflix. So go out there, go get your gains. This has been Patrick, Full Promo Power, your mom's favorite power lifter, and I command you to grow.